Good evening, everyone. My name is Daphna Rubinovich, and may I just say how thrilled I am to be here. Tonight, we here at the Giller offer our second master panel, this one to celebrate International Women's Day and to explore the theme, the perils of publishing while female. First, I'd like to acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Our panel this evening features some incredibly accomplished and talented writers, Karma Brown, Tia Matonyi, and Susan Swan. Unfortunately, Lee Maracle, who was scheduled to join us, was not ultimately able to, and she will be sorely missed. Our host this evening is arts and books editor at the Globe and Mail, Judith Pereira. I will now throw to Judith, who will give a brief bio on each of our participants and get tonight's conversation underway. Thanks, Daphna. So I'll be speaking with Susan Swan, Karma Brown, and Taya Mutanji. Susan Swan is a novelist, teacher, activist, and journalist whose work has been published in 20 countries. In 2019, she won the Gloria Vanderbilt Short Story Award for The Oil Man's Tale and published her eighth book of fiction, The Dead Celebrities Club. Her first novel, The Biggest Modern Woman of the World, about a Canadian giantess who exhibited with P.T. Barnum, is currently being made into a television series. Susan was a York University's Robart Scholar for Canadian Studies in 1999 to 2000 and was a past chair of the Writers' Union of Canada. She is a co-founder of the Carol Shields Prize for Fiction. Welcome, Susan. Karma Brown is the best-selling author of five novels, Recipe for a Perfect Wife, Come Away With Me, The Choices We Make, In This Moment, and The Life Lucy Knew. She is also the author of The 4% Fix, How One Hour Can Change Your Life. A National Magazine Award-winning journalist, Karma has been published in Chatelaine, Canadian Living, Self, Red Book, and Today's Parent. Taya Mutunji. Born in Congo, Kinshasa, Taya's work focuses primarily on friendship, womanhood, race, and sexuality. She holds a degree in media studies and minors in English Lit, and creative writing from the University of Toronto Scarborough, where she specialized in poetry and nonfiction. Her debut collection of short stories, Shut Up You're Pretty, was shortlisted for the Atwood Gibson Writers Trust Fiction Prize and won the Edmund White De Debut Fiction Award and the Trillium Book Award. Taya is the nonfiction editor of Feelways, an anthology of Scarborough writing, coming from Wednesday House this spring. She's also the recipient of the Jill Davis Fellowship in Fiction at New York University, where she'll be an M MFA candidate this fall. So welcome, everyone. So good to be speaking with you tonight. Thank you. Nice to be here. Hi, everybody. So let's start off the perils of publishing as a woman today. How about we start off with you, Susan, since you've been publishing for a while and um, and start off with how it's changed. Have things changed? We've seen more women in the industry. We've seen more women as publicists, as publishers, winning awards. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen through the years. Well, thank you, Judith. I, I have seen enormous changes. I mean, one of the most wonderful things I think that's happened is that women are helping other women writers. And I don't remember that as much when I was starting out because there weren't a lot of women being published. And uh, we started the Carol Shields Prize for Fiction with that in mind, with the sort of idea that you can have mentoring programs where older women writers help younger women writers and we have a network of professional women in publishing. It's quite an activist foundation. And that is really new. And uh, that's the good news. And um, the thing that hasn't changed, which I'd be very curious to see what my uh, younger colleagues think, is that men still have a hard time reading fiction by women. And uh, it's it's a sort of 
ongoing phenomenon. And I think it has something to do with the fact that women are trained from um, an early age to read, translate, if you like, uh, metaphors by male authors. We can all read books about war um, and journeys. Um, and But it seems that men haven't been trained in the, in the schools to accept female metaphors for experience and have a harder time making the leap from sort of situations that might appear in women's novels uh, into universal experience. They see that as something um, rather small and narrow. And, and, and that is, um, okay, I'll, I'll mention his name. David Gilmore was um, really roundly criticized when he said in an interview a few years ago that he didn't read books by women. He just wasn't drawn to them because he wanted to read books by himself, you know, about men like himself. And he was probably speaking for a lot of men when he said that, although, you know, no man would confess to that at the time. Uh, and I think that that is something anyway that um, frustrates me. I wish that wasn't the case. And I don't know, I'm going to pass it over to Tia or Karma to see what their thoughts are about that. And if they even agree with me, maybe, maybe the men you know do read fiction by women. Karma, what are your thoughts about this? I was kind of talking about this a little bit earlier when we talk about sort of the big books of fiction, we say, you know, it's Melville, it's Dickens, it's, uh, it's Philip Roth. Um, where are those, the big women of fiction? And it's hard to kind of point to that. Can you speak a little bit to what Susan's talking about perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I came, I came to, publishing via journalism and I worked in magazine and I did freelance and it was a it was an industry that was basically entirely women I don't think I had a single male editor or a colleague when I was freelancing in magazines because I was writing for women's magazines so most of us were women and then when I came into publishing and of course my editors my publicists they were all women but suddenly there were these readers and like susan was saying there are readers who are men and women and my books initially were put out there as women's fiction which at the time i mean i was brand new into publishing i didn't understand really what women's fiction was aside from the fact that you know they said it was books by women for women and i thought well anyone can read it's sort of like a beach read book right like there's no to me there's no such thing as a beach read book you can read any book on the beach and so i don't know why we put these categories around books but calling you know my books women's fiction in the early days it re, instead of just commercial fiction or fiction the way men's books are referred to uh really put it into a bit of a a box and i had plenty of men who were like well that's not my kind of book because it's obviously a book for women and I would have all these conversations about that that no I mean men can read fiction too and you know men have women in their lives uh, wives and mothers and daughters and so they care about women and care about women's lives and women's journeys so I don't think it has I don't think it has changed that much in that sense. I think we are still really a bit boxed in by women's books are, you know, about women and for women and the journeys that women are going through. Um, I hope that we're, we are making some ground, but yeah, I agree with Susan. I think it's still, it is still, unfortunately, um, you know, we're, we're still a little bit confined, I think by those labels and those categories. Taya, speaking of, you know, being confined, I mean, women of color have always felt sort of confined to other boxes and to what we have to try to protect, uh, pr promote and try to uh, voice. And, and how do you feel about some of these, these uh, topics that we're talking about, about where we fit in? I can't speak too much about the publishing side, seeing as I've only been published for Two, two years at this point, but as um, as a writer and as someone who went to school and studied writer, writing and who has a huge community of writers, 
I definitely, the one switch that I have seen is over the last three years since I began my personal journey, I do see a lot more people of color publishing today. Um, however, it's, I'm unsure if it's because I have just made the effort to not read a predominant amount of white books as I did when I was studying. Maybe it's because I'm actively searching for books written by Black women or women of color in general. So I can't really say just yet if it's because of my personal agenda has changed or if it's like a thing that's actually happening within the industry. Uh, but with this with all this conversation about women versus men fiction is, I'm when you say it, I totally know what you're talking about. But I, I'm not sure that I experienced it as a writer again. A lot of my friends who write and who want to write big books writers that I know that I'm growing up with are women. Um, I actually don't think I have many friends who are men who have interest in publishing in general from reading to writing at all. So from where I'm, from my little corner, it does seem like fiction is slowly transitioning to being a woman dominated field, but I do feel quite boxed into my own little community out of choice. So it's really hard for me to, to I'm not sure if I'm speaking on the publishing industry as a whole, or if it's because of the way that I have chosen to uh, be a writer and the space that I've chosen to occupy, if I just happen to be in a dominant women of color space. Um, but that's not to say that there are more women of color publishing today, because that's absolutely false. But I definitely feel that I'm, I'm in a pretty women-centric space. And perhaps that's my secret little weapon to how I'm going to survive this industry. Well, it's interesting that you say that you have this space. And I mean, we know that women read fiction. Um, those numbers are there. Women read fiction. They buy fiction. If you're looking at who is buying fiction, it is women. Um, and yet, for a long time, when we look at sort of the big fiction writers, the big literary fiction prize winners, they were always predominantly white men. Um, and they wrote about things that perhaps were seen as big sweeping topics, uh, politics, the world, uh, you know, socioeconomic. And women co concentrated on very private lives, the inner life. Do you think that's still the case that women mostly gravitate towards that? And is that somehow seen as less, less, I don't think that's the case. I think that it's uh, women writers are really have a tremendous range, but I think there is still a tendency um, to equate serious fiction as what white male writers write. And uh, I'll give you an example of something I found interesting. I was trying to place a short story of mine in the States two years ago. And um, I, I just out of interest did a list of all the editors of the literary journals and 30 of 31 of them were male. And uh, that tells you something right there because it's at that uh, level where you get uh, men making the decisions to um, publish fiction and what's considered important that matters. I did eventually publish that short story with a male writer, Robert Fogarty of the Antioch Review, who is a, a feminist. But I know from reading authors like Francine Prose, she wrote a very funny um, essay called Scent of a Woman's Ink a few years back in Harper's, which was a response to Norman Mailer's um, essay saying that he couldn't read fiction by women because he could smell the female uh, uh, from the, you know, the ink on the page. And she kind of <laughs> broke apart. I love that. You can smell yeah, the woman. The ridiculous <laughs> comment um, that seems laughable now that a man would say that, but he in, indeed probably did represent a lot of men at that time. And she takes apart the idea that, that women uh, write uh, small interior things and men write big epics. Uh, she put takes it apart quite well, but she feels in her essay, and I agree with her, and the prize really came out of this, there's sort of a critical neglect of women uh, at, at a, the level of serious literature. It's starting to improve with the prizes, uh, awarding more women uh, than they ever have done before. 
But just to give you an idea, and I tweeted about some of this today, in Canada, our Governor General's Award winners, <coughs> um, female authors have won 28 out of 81 times, okay? That's 34%. Um, a very uh, interesting one is our Stephen Leacock Award for Humor. Female authors have won nine times out of 72 times. So that's 12% of the award winners have been female authors, ostensibly, I guess, because they don't think women are funny. Um, I, but that's a, a very startling statistic as is the statistic for the Nobel Prize for Literature. Only 15 women have won the Nobel Prize for Literature out of 116 um, winners. And there was a period in the 60s, from the 60s to the mid 70s, where no woman won the Nobel and for literature. And no one thought that was very unusual. It was, um, just accepted as a matter of course. And there were lots of women writing then. And there are lots of women writing now. There, you know, there are, I think about half the books published by, are by men and half the books published are, are by uh, women in Canada and the same in the States. And yet there's only a third of the book coverage given to women authors and they win only a third of the prizes. And then I found this, I'll stop with these awful new, news no but you know what the prizes are the prizes are a key it's not so much the recognition as what it does to give money to give you the time to write right um right. i mean and that's what every a lot of young writers i talk to now are either and maybe this was always the case but they have to waitress they have to do other things and the minute you win a prize it gives you a chance to give yourself some space to write, to do what you should be doing. And so when you talk about those prizes, it's not just, oh, they're gonna give you your next book, but they're gonna give you that space so that you can actually write your next book, which I think is hard for women to find that. And that's kind of what we're talking about, right, Taya? Yeah, um, I the, the night of the Rogers Rogers Trust Award, which was last November, I actually was waitressing the morning of, <laughs> and then the night before, and then the day after. And I always thought that was really funny that I ran home from my two hour waitressing shift to get ready. And then I went to this big award where um, Andre Alexis had won $50,000. And it was really interesting because at no point did I stop to think, what would I do if I won $50,000? Like, I didn't think, would I stop waitressing because the idea of just writing feels so foreign. Um, but winning prizes has changed my perspective on that. Whereas like where I was sitting when I was there at that award ceremony, I couldn't imagine changing my life for my career. It was just, I'm gonna keep waitressing until I publish my fifth book. Like that was essentially the goal. Um, but then winning the Trillium and then getting support from grants afterwards, that change my focus, it changed my priorities. It gave me room to sort of sit down and finish my projects that I otherwise would not have had. And who's to say if I would be able to, I don't think I would have been able to keep writing had that not happened. I really don't think so. And this is something that we've talked a little bit about today. We saw that the Wyndham Campbell prize went, there were two Canadians who won that prize. And I'm just thinking, wow, okay, that's gonna change their ability to write winning yeah. huge a huge prize like that gives them a little bit of space and which which means that more women who win prizes you get more chance to to think and to write and to be given that space and so i think that speaks to some of your what you're talking about susan yeah, about it, the prizes it, it does it also boosts sales enormously and that's one of the reasons for the Carol Shields Prize is, is economic, that this is um, a way for women to change their economic circumstances and raise their profile. But of course, that award that Tia was just mentioning of 50,000 for Andrea Alexis, that's probably what an office worker makes a year. It really, if you live in a city like Toronto, it's not going to, Tia, you are still going to have to waitress some more until 
you know, uh, you you win a few more awards or your books sell more. It's it's uh, people will make astounded noises about the size of the prizes, but when you really spread them out over the time it takes to write a book, it's not that much. The the Carol Shields Prize is 150k Canadian, and um, but even so, that's you know that's two and a half three years maybe. Um, and that, you know, a writer may still be writing a book of fiction. Um, they can take up to five years or eight years. So these, these awards aren't as uh, huge and lavish as people think when it gets down to the nitty gritty of writers' lives. Uh, yeah. So what would help? I mean, I, I would like to get into talking about some of the content of women's books. You know, um, the, I, I've been reading a lot of actually YA right now um, because I've been uh, preparing to to host different things, and I'm reading a writer who writes such rage in her protagonists, and it's so unnerving for me to read um, a a hero who has such is not likable at all. And I wonder if, you know, when we write women, um, if you're mindful of writing characters that have to be likable so that you can sell books, so that you can, you know, market them. Do you have uh, the ability to, to write about that kind of, uh, it was very unnerving to me to read this book that I've just been reading. And I was like, ooh, this woman is, wow, this character is really not nice. <laughs> but at the same time, her rage was just, it's cathartic. It's exhilarating. Yes. Karma knows about that. Yes, well, Karma. I, 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 mean, I mean, I write commercial fiction. So I live in this place where it actually is quite important that your protagonist is likable, uh, particularly if she's female. And I have had many conversations about this. In my most recent book, Recipe for a Perfect Wife, um, I had conversations with my editors about one of my characters and the fact that she wasn't likable enough. And it was a hard conversation for me to have because I feel like she was very flawed. She made mistakes. Uh, she was young. She should be allowed to make mistakes and do things wrong the way that we all should be allowed to do that. And I feel that women get villainized a lot for, for those mistakes and for being imperfect in literature in particular, when their male counterparts do not. And, you know, that played out in my book where you have a husband and wife and they're both being manipulative and lying. But I will tell you, I get so much, I mean, I get a lot of lovely mail too, but if I get sort of like the hate mail about the book, it's because of my main protagonist who is not likable, who's selfish, um, you know, and, and just like her husband's doing all these lovely things for her, even though he's lying and manipulating her as well. And she should be quite grateful for that. So it is something that I like bounce up against a lot. And I feel really frustrated. I spend a lot of time in book clubs and on Zoom calls defending her and explaining, you know, she's just like all of us. And we're trying to be allowed to be real. Um, and women should be allowed to make mistakes in on the page, off the page. Uh, we all have to learn. So yeah, that is the likability thing really gets under my skin. And I spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, ultimately, you know, sometimes you have to give a little bit because the book needs to go out there and Everybody wants to, you know, a book becomes everyone's, like in a publishing house, it belongs to you, but it also belongs to your editors and marketing. And, and sometimes you have to find that, that balance. So I will continue to strive for that. <laughs> Do you think it's becoming easier? Do you think, sorry, Susan, go ahead. Well, I think it's very, no, I don't, not in, not in what Karma's talking about. I think that there's still this expectation that women will create nice characters. Yes. And that they should, and, and that women should be nice. And I, I, I'll give you an example, Claire Massoud's novel, The Woman Upstairs, which was about a difficult and eccentric female character. I heard her go on uh, radio shows, she wrote about it, she was written up in the newspapers that, you know, it was a good book, but the woman was so unlikable. And it really worked against her book. And she, like you, Karma, uh, I think she was almost driven to tears 
um, that she couldn't get across to some of the critics, um, that it was a portrait of a person with all their flaws and strengths. And there was no law that said women had to be represented in a certain way. Now here's another way that um, women writers get pressure put upon them um, uh, when they write about sexuality. If they write about sexuality really um, honestly, uh, it, there, there's a tendency for it to be called salacious or, or smutty. And I was very pleased when I read Tia's wonderful stories, which handle sexuality of a young woman in such a human and natural and, and sort of thrilling way that nobody was coming down on her that I read of anyway, maybe she'll tell us differently, <laughs> writing these stories. But I, I, I'll give you a couple of examples of being, that show this when I wrote um, The Wives of Bath and The Last of the Golden Girls. The Wives of Bath, a, a professor from Waterloo was coming across the border from the States and The Wives of Bath was taken out of his knapsack as obscene material that he was bringing into Canada. It had been published in the US and in Canada. And that's laughable. Now, this would be, I guess, in 1994. And um, I'd been invited in 1996 to the Adelaide Literary Festival. And um, someone on the Canada Council told the Adelaide Council not to invite me when they heard that I'd been invited, that I, that I should be de-invited because I, you know, I didn't represent um, Canada in my literature, that I wasn't the kind of writer that they would choose to represent Canada. And it was just because I had written, um, I tried to convey the female experience as I knew it uh, and their sexuality in an honest way. I wasn't trying to um, write pornographically, but I was treated as if, as if I was. And there were, there was one other uh, thing that happened where the last of the Golden Girls, uh, there were obscenity charges raised in Alberta after I read an excerpt on CBC radio. And my publisher at the time um, was kind of thrilled and horrified both because they thought it would get, <laughs> they would get publicity, but they didn't have very much money. This was a small press, Lester Norp and Dennis. And in the end, the, the uh, Edmonton detective of the Morality Squad read the, read the book and he found the passage charming. But there was all this sort of reaction to my work <clears throat> where people were bringing a set of expectations to it that I didn't have when I was writing and I wasn't trying to deliver what they were expecting. And I think if I'd been male, that, that wouldn't have happened like that. Anyway, that's my story of the old days. I'm very pleased about Tia's book. I think it's uh, really wonderful to see it's accepted and it's a brilliant piece of writing. And anyway. And do you think that's changed Tia with, the, with an imprint such as the one that you, that we're getting different presses and willing to push that sex, like real true sexuality um, stories about that or stories about anger and stories about or do you find that you do get that pushback? As you said, you've only been in for a couple of years, but how is that, is that felt? Have you felt any of that pull push? Um, I think I've always sort of approached my characters, never really concerned with the idea of likability. Um, I was more concerned with being relatable because I, my characters, without me having to explicitly say this character is about a black girl or a black woman, um, it's just obvious. It's just who my character is. But the idea of, well, knowing who reads books the most, will people who read this book who are not black be able to relate to this character? So that was my personal battle that I had with everything I've written up to date. It's the not really about being likable. I actually don't enjoy likable characters if i'm reading a novel and 20 pages in the character is trying too hard to be likable or the character is being painted as being sort of like uh acceptable <laughs> by society it doesn't feel real to me because i don't i don't know a single woman who is just wildly accepted in the world that to read a character like that feels like a little bit of a over edit to me so i just try to avoid making my character perfect um i 
I've approached my writing, especially for my characters, as I write about the messy, drunken black girl who's crying behind a dumpster when nobody knows why. Like that's my brand. Um, those type of characters are historically not necessarily liked, so I knew that already. And so I never, I never had a different character in mind. This has always been the character that I wanted to write, and I will continue writing these characters who are real to me, the ones who make way too many mistakes and who um, have no sense of direction whatsoever. That just, that fuels me because I recognize that character in myself and in the people around me, regardless of race. So that makes, that makes sense to me. I, I just, I can't imagine writing a character who, who is good, who is nice, doesn't, <laughs> I, I don't even know what that means to be good or nice or correct. Um, but I, I will say that I'm very much, drawn to the idea of rage right now and books especially written by women who have a character who is just angry i'm just like yes get get me more mad so that's we're in that right now um yeah so i i don't i'm not really thinking about being liked at all um but in terms of sexuality that too i think writing for me i i knew that if i was going to become a writer and i was going to write stories a part of it had to be on my terms I don't believe that I'm capable of writing a character outside of what I write because I lack interest for it. So I, I wouldn't be here if, if I was doing it any other way. Do you think you would write male characters or would you? Not me. I'm not interested in writing male characters. I get asked all the time why the characters in the book, they're like, what about the husbands? What were you thinking with the husbands? And would you like to take the book and maybe write it from the husband's perspective? And I always say there's so many books written about men and about male characters and the male journey. And so I will let those books do that. And I'm going to stick with the ladies because I'm interested in women. Uh, that is it for me. Sort of what Taya was saying, you know, that's my brand. I'm interested in women's stories and looking at just different, you know, stories and journeys that these women take, um, have different experiences, but yeah, I'm not into the male protagonist thing. Was Recipe for a Good Wife, which I just read and enjoyed very much, was, was that about the female character that people complained that she wasn't nice enough? Yes. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you- I, I had to like make changes to her. I mean, this was the thing, like I, changed her to fit because you know this is the reality it, it, a big publisher pays you money for your book and it is no longer just your book and that's okay once you're in it then you understand that that's how this business works so there is a part where you're trying to figure out okay well i need to i need to keep you know the parts that are important to me but i also have to be cognizant of the fact that this is a partnership and so you know i did make changes to her and i did these things to make her more likable i thought and everyone was okay on the publishing side but yes people are just like whoa they hate her they think she's just selfish and her husband's so nice and i'm always like well he's lying and trying to like he's messing with her birth control for god's sakes like you know, trying to get her he pregnant. Wasn't so nice. He wasn't so he nice. wasn't, but people just it's forgivable. It's just more forgivable, I think, for those male characters. And I wonder too, with the marketability and the selling of books, is that are women not allowed this this because of who controls how books are sold? Um, so you can't be, or maybe you know, to be truly honest means you don't sell as many books but why not why when men would they their honesty is appreciated <laughs> and in fact has always been like no this is a true man. well I mean like David Nichols um who wrote one day and he wrote us which was a book that people were like this is a masterpiece about marriage and I Okay, I'm not going to say whether it's a masterpiece or not, but it is just a book about marriage. And if it was written by women, it wouldn't have, I don't think, had the same uh, fanfare that it had. You know, the fact that he was able to tap into this really emotional experience of marriage between a man and a woman and, and the messiness of it and the flaws was seemed to be like really 
unique, you know, to, to critics and, and to book buyers. And so that one always sort of confused me. I just thought like, what's happening here? This is, this is a book about marriage. It's been written a lot of different ways by men and women. So, you know, yeah. A lot I, of examples I, of that, I think. I just, well, have, go ahead. The, I mean, when we talk about the perils of publishing while female, it's, it's some of these things, right? Can we deal with the rage in, in literature? And maybe that's part of what I have seen in the past year is that you are getting women able to push more, mm -hmm. be more honest. I don't know whether anybody read Luster by- uh, I love that book. I, uh, right. I, I wanted to go back, circle back really quickly to what Karma was saying about male characters. I forgot that I had a father figure in my book and a brother figure. Though when my editor sort of said what happened to the sibling and the dad, I said, oh, I forgot about them. So I wrote the story where the dad dies so that I could continue forgetting about them <laughs> because I just was like, I don't really know. I completely forgot to include the father in stories. So I just wrote a new one where he no longer existed so that I can move on. Um, so that's a fun little anecdote of how, how I'm gonna keep at it. But yes, Lester, I, I loved Lester. I thought it was fantastic. But I've also read a lot of the reviews that Lester gets for the character and how people relate to it. And I'm gonna compare really quickly to TikTok, right? Cause I'm also on TikTok for some reason at night. And I see the way women who are consuming these contents from women, are criticizing women. We like haven't really, the whole boss woman culture is not real in the sense that like women are not supporting each other in a public space the way we would like to think they are. Yes, our friends, yes, our colleagues, but once we're out in the world, the hardest criticism I get are from women. And when I see that on my social medias, I see that in my personal life. I see that having been a waitress, having been a high school teacher. If someone's gonna criticize me the hardest, it will be another woman and that sucks. So that's probably why books by men are still dominating. It's not just the fault really of the publisher. It is maybe like 80%, but for the rest, we still, the people who are consuming your books, they want something specific. And when we don't meet that specific goal, they will attack us for it. And when I read some of the reviews that Lester gets, written on Goodreads, for example, by women, it's like, are you telling me that you've never been 23 and upset? How are you destroying a character for the weirdest reasons? Like, okay, so we live in this world. And I feel like until we are combating that, it's gonna be harder for us to keep publishing books the way we want, because who are reading the books? Women are. And then we're also like, what about uh, non-binary writers? Like, it's just, there's so many more things to look at now. And it's like, if we, personally, for me at least, if I were to sit here and focus too hardly on how people are gonna perceive it or what publishing wants, then I will never have a happy career. So I, it's like, you have to draw a line and content-wise, character-wise, how I choose to present myself as a writer has to be on my own terms. And if it means I don't get published and I don't get published, because whether I write a likable character or not, someone online is going to have something negative to say about it. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I read a lot of the, um, I mean, I had Raven um, Lalani who, who wrote Luster. I, I did a QA and a with her. Um, and it is one of the things is that her character is not likable. You know, it's she's she's a young black woman who who drinks, who has sex with a lot of people at work, who who then put, takes up with a married man. Like, there's lots of things about her that are you're like, ha, my hero. Not, if I'm being honest, but she's real, and this is the thing: or we we're not allowed to be real because being real gets us because we've always been maybe the the we we interpret we show a different world of ourselves you know we 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 do it through the gaze of a man we don't if you if you're too honest about who you are then you won't um you won't be accepted perhaps but maybe this is changing now sort of well, the, well these two yeah. young women writers are very very confident and determined to do things their own way i th i think that's a um 
really something, actually. You're not saying, um, oh, well, gee, maybe I shouldn't have made her uh, quite so um, critical. Maybe she should have been nicer. You're, and you're, you're, you're just going with what you feel is right. And that's what a writer has to do. I'm interested in the next book of ra about rage. That sounds uh, fascinating. Are you it both writing about rage? Yeah. I mean, I have a 12 year old daughter too. And I, I think about that a lot. Um, you know, also speaking like as a woman who's trying to write and mother and it's, you know, there, the, the money thing and the advance and the awards, and that is one thing that does allow people the opportunity, the, the space and focus, uh, motherhood is like another thing entirely that is really tricky. I mean, I've been asked yeah. like, when I'm out on, when I've been on book tour, you know, where my daughter is, like, who's looking after her? <laughs> like, like truly, I mean, that is a question that female authors get asked all the time. If they continue to get asked that, it's That's like, so well, her dad is looking after her because he, we co-parent this child. Like I am the, you know, primary caregiver, but I also have a career. Um, so yeah, I think like, I think about rage. I'm very full of rage right now, even though I, you know, I'm smiling and, but I'm quite full of rage <laughs> right now about what's going on in the world and about men and about having a 12 year old daughter who I want the world to look very different for, and it's probably not going to. So yeah, I think rage will continue to come out in, you know, however that comes out for me or for Taya or whoever's writing about rage is going to look different for for us based on our experiences but yes i'm feeling i'm just gonna sorry i'm just gonna remind um our audience that they can uh put in questions in the question and answer uh if they'd like to ask a few questions of our panelists um i'm gonna ask one more question before we start to go to the question and answer portion what about men writing women how we talked you talked a little bit about writing male protagonists, how do you feel about men writing female protagonists? And is there an appropriation there? Um, I'm going to kick this off because I'm going to also answer this in terms of race. I think that when you do the right research, when you have a sensible reader, it is possible that you do write by the character that you're writing. But without it, us readers will be able to tell. And as people who occupy that identity will have feelings about it and we would be allowed to. So I don't think it's impossible and I don't think that men shouldn't. Um, but I do also know that a lot of writers in general are eager to write without doing proper research or without um, gaining a sense of authority over what they're writing. And that could create a lot of chaos for everybody involved. Um, so that's my take on it. And I say that because I've been asked about Women, white women writing characters who are black or who are from another cultural racial background. I personally don't have a problem with it. I just also know that it could go terribly wrong if you don't do the work, right? And so it's really a matter of that. Um, otherwise, I'm all for it because if, if more people had been writing people of color up until this point, a lot of the barriers that I have to face today, I probably wouldn't have if it was already common to have Black characters. Raven probably wouldn't have if it was already common to have a young Black character who was messy and chaotic, if that was okay, if we had permission. Um, so yeah, I, I sort of wish that we could go back and that would have been more okay. Susan, Karma? I. I agree. I mean, I think that, um, you know, there is something about having that lived experience and the nuances of what it means to be female. You know, I can always tell when it's a man who's using a pen name writing as a woman. I, it is just, you can just tell. And I think even when you do all your research, um, there is that lived experience that, and that nuance of the experience that is really hard to nail unless you have been through it. I, I, you know, I, that's just, so it, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, uh, but I so far have not read amazing female characters written by men. Yeah, I'm having trouble trying to think of one. I guess there's um, Madame Bovary. That's a little bit. I mean, 
but uh, that's debatable. <laughs> what? That's debatable. I read Madame Bovary when I was younger and I loved it, and then I read it again in my twenties. I was like, what? Going on. <laughs> no, I haven't read it since I was in my 20s. Maybe I should do that. You should. Please do that. I'll tell you something <laughs> funny about writing a male voice because the, my last novel is about a hedge fund uh, fraudster and it's called the, um, the Dead Celebrities Club. And it's based on a man who um, basically takes advantage of people and sees himself as the victim. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized writing from a male perspective that it wasn't, it didn't feel that hard because I hear men talking about themselves all the time and explaining things. And so it wasn't, it didn't feel like a huge jump into the male psyche. Um, whereas perhaps women are, um, have had to be a little bit more, hide their real selves a bit in these more traditional um, societies. And now we're getting starting to get a fuller look at female characters from a female perspective, but going the other way around, it wasn't it wasn't so um, difficult as I expected. Anyway, okay, I'm just going to go to the question questions now from the audience. Um, uh, how do you select a good publisher for a first novel? It's from Cassandra. Well. That's a that's a long, complicated question. I mean, there's a lot of different things you need to look at. I think um, some when with my first book, the way I selected the good publisher was the one who made me the offer, uh, the only one who made me the offer, and I was very delighted to take that offer. So I think in the beginning, you know, it's you don't always have a choice, but I do think that when if you have a great agent and they know where your book would would be well suited and which publisher would really be able to do um, the right thing with that story, then you know you trust your agent to put your book in front of the right people that way from the traditionally published side and for the bigger, bigger publishers, that's what I would say. But yeah, it's the people who are the ones who say, here is the check and we would like to put your book on the shelf, so. <laughs> yeah. I I mean, my publishing history is a little bit bizarre, so I'm not going to get into that, but I would agree that having a good agent makes the difference. Um, and I, I would even say, at least where I'm at in my stage, having a great agent that's on your team is perhaps even better than having the right or the best publisher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agent's really important. Mm. Yeah, and only, um, uh, I think 80% of Canadian writers are not agented. Really? Wow, it's, it's really almost harder to get an agent than it is to it is. get a publisher. Yeah. So, and I, I um, do a lot of mentoring creative writing, and I always tell my students, go and look at their websites, the agents, and see what they are asking um, as a requirement for submission, and look at the writers they're publishing, and and try a number of them at the same time. Although I know it's not supposed to be polite to do that but it takes a long time to find the right fit so no, you should query mm -hmm. multiple agents at once i don't think it is never in the writer's favor to wait to hear back from an agent i heard back from an agent after my first book had published like two years after i had queried so wow you know, right yeah query lots and widely for sure yeah I agree. Yeah. Um, Doriana asks, would you care to give a shout out to a book that has been recently published or not so recent that you admire and enjoyed reading other than your, this panel? Um, I, every, I, I loved Lester so much. Um, I did also like Queenie, um, but Lester for sure by Raven Lilaney. That was fantastic. And the conversation that I've been having with people who have read the book as well, regardless of their race or background, have been probably the most exciting ones that I've had in a really long time. I just recently let, read um, Mexican Gothic. Mm -hmm. If you have, I've been into horror a lot because the world has been such a stormy place that I need to read horror because it's so much worse than what's happening like in real life. So if you haven't read Mexican Gothic, it is, it is um, Gothic horror. It's beautifully written and 
she's Canadian. Look it up. It's, it was, yeah, it was so enjoyable. I really love that one. What about you, Susan? Well, I, as I said earlier, I'm writing, reading a lot of political books and I, I just read one called Cynical Theories by Helen Pluckrose, which is mm. uh, an analysis of, of um, the social justice ideology where you can only uh, write about certain um, characters in a certain way. Um, it takes down a lot of the I guess it takes apart a lot of the ideology that has become, um, it started out with the kind of wonderful inclusive, need for inclusiveness and awareness but that it has become a bit, unfortunately, authoritarian. And it's really a critique mm -hmm. of that part of the social justice movement, which I identify with, but I don't identify with the uh, ideological rigidity of some aspects of it. And she deals with that in great detail. Anyway, it's Cynical Theories by Helen Pluckrose. Pluckrose, okay. When you write about powerful, angry, strong women who are not likable characters, how do you know when you are writing true characters or whether you're writing for the shock value? How do you keep that compass pointed in the right direction? so that it's a true character as opposed to? For me, a, a character always has to have a bit of myself in it and then a part that's not like me. And if I can emotionally identify with part of the character, uh, that's someone I don't um, uh, know, then it, it, it works. And I, I don't really think of shock value in, in terms of the characters, it's more about my fascination with certain types of people, for instance, like the fraudster, like what, what makes a fraudster tick? Can they ever, you know, can they ever be uh, reformed? And that sort of thing. And so I, I had to realize with the fraudster that there's a part of me that as a writer uh, who likes to, um, who believes my lie and gets excited about it. And the lie is a piece of fiction, right? And once I understood the fraudster as someone who's, who's a bit of a storyteller, believing in you know um, his uh, scam as as a piece of creative work in a way, then I could enter him. So I, it's more about whether I can identify with the characters rather than about what impact they're going to have. Um, Karma or Taya? For me, it's not really about making sure the character is messy, angry, or. Um, have any shock value at all it's about the story that I'm telling and those things come out naturally because it's just part of life it's you know natural reactions or how I imagine I would behave or someone like my character would behave should they be faced with these circumstances so the way that the character comes off is not necessarily as intentional as just the story that they're loving um, so mm -hmm. I feel like that's how it stays honest to me. And that's how I'm not essentially trying to shock anyone really is I'm telling a specific story and then trying to make sure that the reaction, emotion and drive is as real as I, it can be. Yeah, I, that's similar for me too. I try to make my characters feel like re real people. I give them hobbies and I give them favorite songs and colors and like nightmares when they were kids. And so when I go to write them on the page, they <coughs> are, uh, like a whole complete person who, you know, then I feel like I'm talking to for the next two years because that's how long you sit there with them. <laughs> but again, I also don't do the shock value thing. I mean, the decisions that they make, whether they are shocking decisions uh, are really having to do with that character arc and where that, that story has to go and where that character has to go because the characters have to change. Yeah, uh, They have to go through something. So that's more what drives that for me. There's another question uh, from Anne, and she's curious about why women might be each other's harshest critics. How much might this have to do with the fact that there is such limited space for women that you feel that you need to attack? Um, is, are there thoughts on that about why we're such harsh critics of each other? Really good question. I, I think women have often um, been the sort of monitors of other women's social behavior and I went to a girls boarding school and it, it felt like you were guilty until proven innocent sort of. There was a, um, we had a, a matrons that 
were very cruel to us. And uh, then we had some wonderful teachers too. But I think it might be a survival thing where women are grooming each other, thinking that they have to, you know, you have to uh, shape up or you're going to get into trouble. And trouble, uh, once upon a time, was, was real trouble. You know, I think of my mother's generation was so worried about all of us who would live with men before we married them. And, and um, they thought that was appalling. And their, their concern was, and criticism about it, was really in, in heart protective. Anyway, that's just my theory for the evening. And maybe maintain optics about the way women are supposed to be. I mean, I think there's a, there are so many messages that have been fed for so many years about, for always about how women need to behave. And um, that I think is just, it's so strong. You know, I have found myself having to really change because I'm 48. So I sort of grew up in this time where it was still a bit traditional and there were certain roles that women were supposed to, to fulfill. And so I've had to really shake up how I view being a woman, being married, being a mother uh, in this, this section of my life. And I think there's, it's the messaging that we fall back on that. And, and you have to remind yourself that you don't, you don't need to, you know, police women, other women, as Susan was yeah. saying, like, we don't need to do that. We need to support each other and lift each other up with all our messiness and our flaws. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think it's sort of a combination of living in a patriarchal society who teaches us to hate women. Um, we're dealing with like so much more accessible um, misogyny, mis misogynist noir, um, anti-blackness, all of us, all of these big ideologies that so many people have believe in intimately. And now that we have social media and this wide range of communication, uh, it's in our faces in a way that's a lot more intense. So we're now, it's it's easier for us to be like, okay, this is an example of patriarchy or okay, this is an example of racism. These things are now sort of part of our daily life. So I don't think that it's an excuse. And I don't think that women who decide to participate in these sort of behavior slash ideologies are victims of our society. I think that they are perpetrators of it. So um, yeah, that's how I feel about that. It's an interesting thing that you're talking about, Taya, but because for a long time, um, you know, I've been one of few uh, non-white editors and you kind of develop a way of being mm -hmm. to fit in to make sure that things are going okay. And then you have sometimes people who come in and you're like, oh my God, you're, you're gonna cause so much stress and you're gonna shake things up, don't shake things up. It's like, we're gonna get in trouble, you know? Um, and it's interesting that you say that because it, it is, you kind of find yourself sometimes policing each other because you don't want to get in trouble. Um, what you said, Susan, as well. So very, that's very, it's true. I think and for a lot of women. Um, and, oh, this is an interesting question. Um, Someone is saying that when they write a female character, I always hear a stereotypical female voice in my head. Um, how do you sort of overwrite that voice so that you, so that the stereotype stops being so loud and that you can get to the real I, I had a one great tip when I was early in my writing career where uh, someone had said to me, okay, take this scene that you've written and then write it in the exact opposite way. Like do something completely different from what your natural instinct was for that scene or that person. And that it works so well because we all have our biases and those stereotypes, whether it's the voice or the setting or whatever it is. And so to flip it like that, to just try to experiment and see what happens with a character when you do the opposite of, of what your instinct was. I think that's a way that you can challenge yourself um, with a character to see what is possible for them or what how they might change. Susan or Taya? I think, that, I think that's good advice. Um, certainly, uh, you could write a dialogue out with the stereotype voice. It's a Jungian technique, and you, you know, you go, "Hi, colon, it's me, um, Susan," and then stereotype character, colon, 
high and then you ask it questions in this sort of uh, dialogue form and you have to do it spontaneously you can't overthink of it overthink it and the stereotype character will give you some probably amazing answers if you just let the first thing that comes into your head down or into the dialogue I, I do that a lot actually when i'm stuck on characters and the stereotype is probably not a stereotype really when you get to know them yeah, I agree with Susan. I think I, I tend to lean into that. Um, again, having to bring a brace for this, for this because the way that we have seen Black characters has predominantly been through stereotypes. Um, and really what happens when a stereotype gets created is someone who hates a certain archetypes and exploits it in a way that it becomes a stereotype. So for me, when I, I knew I wanted to write about a refugee girl who ends up living in government housing. All these things were essentially stereotypical. Um, and it was, okay, well, where's the humanity? Like, at what point does this character stop being a character and becomes a person? How can I get there? Let me find that. Mm. Let me find that humanity in these characters. Um, so I think that stereotypes are a great pool. Um, I, I love it. I love a good stereotype. I'm going to get into it and I'm going to prove it wrong, essentially. <laughs> so the only thing that I do is that. Oh, we're having such a good conversation, but I just looked at the time. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wait, I have to, unfortunately, wind this up and uh, bring Daphna uh, da uh, here and uh, and for her to wrap up the evening. This is so sad because I'm having a great time. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to do this again. Daphna. Here you are. Oh my gosh, that was so absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much to our fabulous moderator, Judith, and our equally fabulous panelists, Karma, Susan, and Taya. And thank you all for joining us. Please check our websites for our upcoming monthly master panels and uh, register when they become available. Thank you and good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.